Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals meet over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at The Real Science Exchange, and we're thrilled to be back with one of our most popular and special segments, and that's the Legacy Series. In these segments, we recognize the true pioneers in our industry, both past and present. We take a look at their lives, their impact on, le- uh, on agriculture, and their legacy. Tonight, we have the honor of celebrating the life and career of Dr. Temple Grandin from Colorado State University. Dr. Grandin's name is synonymous with animal welfare, using her insights to improve the lives of animals around the world. So uh, with that, welcome, Temple, and thank you for agreeing to uh, join us tonight and allowing us to highlight uh, your career. Well, it's really wonderful to be here. Yeah. Temple, you know, one of the things that uh, I've come to admire about you is your flair for Western wear. And I notice you, you're, you're wearing some Western wear tonight. Uh, so how did that fondness uh, come about? Well, it started out when I was in high school. I got the opportunity to visit with uh, at my aunt's ranch out in the West. And that's how I got into the cattle industry. And that brings up a really important point. Students get interested in things they get exposed to. So as a teenager, I got exposed to cattle. Um, hadn't been um, west of the Mississippi until I was a teenager. And I always liked the, the West. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. I, I grew up on a farm myself, and I don't think you see it or not, but I'm wearing a bolo tie, uh, tie tonight, uh, Temple, in honor of uh, uh, being with you okay. here this evening. Oh, great. This wonderful. thing's probably 40 years old. I haven't worn it in quite a while, but uh, uh, in honor of you, I'm wearing that. Um, we have another guest with us here tonight. Uh, she's a successful author and has gotten to know uh, Dr. Grandin quite well, and that's Betsy Lerner. Uh, welcome, Betsy, and thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, Betsy, can, just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, tell us how you first met Temple. I was a book editor uh, at Houghton Mifflin, one of the a house that's recently been acquired by another company, but at the time it was one of the great independent publishers. And I was a fairly young editor. It was 25 years ago, and I read an article in The New Yorker by Oliver Sacks called An Anthropologist on Mars. And it was a profile of, of Temple and uh, mm. her autism and her many accomplishments. So I reached out to see if she would like to do a book. And she had already published a book called Emergence, um, a real very early memoir of her early life. But we decided to go to contract and, and do a book that became Thinking in Pictures. Yep, this is it right here. Uh-huh, very this is well. The, um, this is uh, got a new afterward that we did uh, two years ago in it. What was the published date of that? First published date? 1995. 1995. And now you have a new book called That's Visual right. Thinking. Visual Thinking. Yeah. And yeah. I can tell you why, what motivated me to write this book. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that'd be great. And, and, uh, uh, and also let us know where you can buy that book. Oh, you can find it at any bookshop. Uh, Amazon has got it. It's all the outlets have, have got it. It's easy to find. Um, well, right before COVID shut everything down, I went to f- on some trips and I realized that we had a skill loss issue. I went to two state-of-the-art pork processing plants, a state-of-the-art chicken processing plant, and discovered that all the equipment was uh, imported from Holland. Then I went to the Steve Jobs Theater and the structural glass walls were from designed in Italy, built in Germany, and the roof came from Dubai. Then later on, I found out that the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine, not potato chips, electronic chips, came from Holland. And I'm going, we've got a problem here. And it goes back to our educational system. I, when the kids are like in ninth grade in Holland and Denmark, they can choose to go the university route or maybe the tech route. We have a tendency to sort of look at the tech route as a lesser form of intelligence. But I can tell you right now, I worked with a lot of brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, guys that barely graduated from high school that were inventing and patenting complicated equipment. And the problem is these people are retiring out and they're not getting replaced. Check out the people fixing elevators and escalators. 
you are going to see a lot of gray hair. Mm. We've got a skill problem. And mm. so that was one of the big motivations. And COVID comes along. So the book was a big COVID project for me. I called up Betsy. She needed COVID project too. And uh, we got together and worked on the book, what we did. Oh, excellent. Bet Betsy, how would you uh, say that this uh, last book, which was published in, what, in October, I believe, of last year, mm -hmm. so it's brand new, how does that differ from the, uh, the original book, Thinking in Pictures? Uh, I like to think of them as bookends. Thinking in Pictures was a memoir primarily about how Temple discovered she was a visual thinker. And she describes in that book in great detail how she sees images and how they work in an associative way in her mind and short films in her mind. And I'll let her talk about that. But visual thinking 25 years later backs up all that personal knowledge and experience with the science behind it and all of the studies she's discovered and dug up and synthesized along the way to help us understand why some of us are visual thinkers, some of us are more verbal thinkers, and where we fall on the spectrum. Before we get too far into this, I wanted to introduce my other co-host tonight, which is uh, Carrie Estes. Uh, Carrie, you've been here before, and you're also a Cal girl in your own right. Uh, you even have a writing steer. So would you mind telling us that story real quick? Yes, yes. Um, he is my baby. He's 10 years old now. He's a Holstein steer. Um, and he was actually one of my steers from my research project. I had 10 of them. Um, and I, I definitely fell in love with, his name is Henry. Um, so when my master's project was over, I purchased him from the university and brought him home with me. And at the time I didn't have a horse to ride. And so I trained him to be a riding steer. So. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Yeah, I love love the pictures. Uh, Temple, before we get started, um, for those folks that may not know you real well, just kind of wanted to go over uh, uh, some background, um, okay. some history. Uh, Grandin, you became a prominent author and speaker on both autism and animal behavior, and today you're a professor of animal science at Colorado State University. You've been featured on uh, national public radio, appeared on national TV shows, Articles about you have appeared in Time Magazine, New York Times, Discover Magazine, Forbes, USA Today, and HBO even did a, uh, an, an Emmy Award-winning movie about your life titled Temple Grandin, and that movie's uh, currently available on Netflix. Certainly like to encourage people to go out there and watch that. I uh, found it to be very interesting. Um, with that, uh, Temple, I'd like to talk a little bit let's start back at the beginning as a child how did you how did you come to realize that you were a visual thinker tonight's pubcast stories are brought to you by reassure precision release choline reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk reduced metabolic disorders and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements visit balchem.com to learn more well, when I first um, started my cattle uh, behavior research when I was in my 20s, I thought everybody was a visual thinker. I didn't know that my thinking was different. And so the first thing I did was look at what cattle were seeing when they were walking through chutes and they would refuse to move. There were shadows or chains hanging down and coats on fences or vehicles parked along a facility. And it wasn't until my late 30s that I discovered that a lot of people are not visual thinkers. And that was a shock to me. And the way I discovered that, I was at an autism conference and I was talking to a speech therapist. And if I say something to somebody who's a visual thinker, think about church steeples, they, they sort of see a whole bunch of specific ones, they name them off. But this speech therapist just saw this point. Okay. That's all she saw very vague. And I'm going, wow, something different's going on here. And then I started questioning people about how I think, how they think. And I used the church steeple question because I found that worked better than house, car, or dog. Because most people are so familiar with that, they can visualize it. But church steeples are just out there in the environment. People don't pay that much attention to them. But you see them every day. And I found that that tended to differentiate 
a visual thinker who would just name them off. And then there were some people where they get a generalized steeple that maybe had more detail. And then, we, of course, we discovered in the book some people have anphantasia. They have no visual thinking at all. And, and, and then I started asking other people. Then I found there was a third kind, pattern thinker. So you have the photorealistic visual thinker, pattern thinker, and a word thinker. And then while working on one of my other books, The Autistic Brain, I found the research. I found a single paper in the reference list of another paper. This was Kochivnikov. I can never say it right. Where she differentiated between an object visualizer like me and the more mathematical pattern thinker. And they were actually two different things. And I thought, wow, hit the jackpot. And I discovered this magic key word object visualizer you cannot find the paper if you don't use that keyword object very, visualizer yeah very interesting temple for uh you know one of the things i want to accomplish today uh, with this webinar is kind of give our listeners a, you know a real deep understanding into who you are as a person and uh how your career unfolded would you mind taking this back to the beginning and and tell us what it was like growing up as as a young uh, child um with autism well, I had no speech until age four. I had excellent early intervention. If you've got a two-year-old that's not talking, you've got to get them into therapy. And if you can't get therapy, then get some grandmothers or somebody to work with the kid. Because the worst thing you could do is to just let them zone out on electronics. Worst thing you could possibly do. So I had really good early intervention. Great uh, elementary school teachers. Um, my mother had a very good sense of, you know, things I could do. Got me out doing things. I'm seeing too many autistic kids today that aren't learning shopping and just basic skills. And a great third grade teacher, fabulous science teacher when I was in high school, because I was a bored student, not interested in studying. And he gave me interesting projects to show me how studying was the way to become a scientist. Mm. Then I was motivated. Yeah, very interesting. Betsy, kind of curious. Um, I'm sure you researched autism a bit um, as you're working uh, with Dr. Grandin. Um, you know, back 70 years ago, what did we know about autism and were there any uh, um, identified treatments? And um, what, what can you tell us about that? Well, originally autism was blamed on, um, guess who, mothers. And they were known as refrigerator mothers. And people thought that children with autistic traits, such as lack of communication, lack of speech, couldn't attach, couldn't hug, was because the mothers were cold and withdrawn. And in 2023, we now know that it's a genetic trait. So we've come a, a very long way. But it's, I think, been a, probably a very bumpy road for people with autism because it's also a spectrum condition and it, it and I don't think any two autistic people like any two um, euro neuro, neurotypical people are the same. W would you agree, Temple? Well, I would agree with that. You see, you've got a spectrum that's going all the way from Einstein, who had no language till age three. Einstein, if he was a child today, would definitely land in an autism program. You know, that's where today where most kids that have delayed speech end up. And then at the other end of the spectrum, You've got somebody who's nonverbal who cannot dress themselves. I'm um, very, you know, much, much more severe challenges. Now, some of the nonverbal individuals can learn to type independently, and and they may never learn to speak, but some of them can learn to type. That definitely needs to be encouraged. But it's such a big spectrum. I I've, I've been out to the Silicon Valley tech companies. I'm going to tell you about half those programmers have got some degree of autism. Uh, we wouldn't even have this um, StreamYard platform to, to talk on now if it wasn't for some autistic brains uh, working on it. That's interesting. What do we know about the autistic brain that gives uh, people on the spectrum this gift? Well, you see, attention to detail. Verbal thinkers tend to overgeneralize. Broad concepts. Um, my mind thinks in specific examples. Okay, I get on committees and we were talking about accommodations for different people. I don't talk about it in generalities. Just the other day, I was with a company that does travel 
and they had a blind person and he was telling me about his biggest um, problem at the airport is finding gates. So okay. let's develop an app called gate finder. And there's various ways you could do this. You see, that's something specific, something very specific that's doable. Where okay. sort of abroad, well, we just got to do accommodations. Let's hmm. do something that I think with present technology, you could do fairly easily. You need to put transponders on the gates or you make sure the numbers are big enough so an AI program can read the gate numbers. Yeah, very interesting. I think our you airport's know, going to work just fine. As some other airports, I'm going to have to put up some bigger numbers. Yeah. Temple, uh, when did you first become uh, interested in animals? Was that at that, a young age? That started as a teenager. Okay. Um, I was bullied and teased in school. I had a horrible time in high school. I got kicked out of a regular high school, and I went to a special boarding school, and they had horses. Okay. And they put me to work cleaning horse stalls and taking care of the horse barn. Also, riding <coughs> and getting horses ready for show was the only place I was not bullied. So, again, this is exposure. Horses were my life when I was a teenager. And then I went, went out to my aunt's ranch. Is there a particular horse that's had a lasting impact on you well, there was a when horse, you were growing up? Well, there was a horse named Bay Lady, and I had a roommate, and we had to share her. So, like, I might be in the equitation class and she'd be in the Western pleasure class. Uh, because they didn't have that many horses that were really good. They, You've never they, ridden a steer, have you, Temple? I've not ridden a steer. I've just seen people doing that. <laughs> and I have a picture of somebody riding a steer I use in my, in my talk. To, so this is a steer that uh, has a low stress, no fear cattle handling, and he's got a Western saddle on. I remember seeing that one yeah. <laughs> and connecting with it. <laughs> yeah. I'm kind of curious. So you, you, we were talking before about the different kinds of thinkers, Temple, and I, I, and I didn't write them all down, but I understand that you, you outline those in the new book. In the new book, Visual Thinking, yeah. I outline the three basic kinds of thinking. Object visualizer like me thinks in photorealistic pictures, terrible at higher math and algebra. Abstract okay. math you can't do. Then you have your visual spatial pattern math thinker. These are going to be your music and math people, your programmers, chemists, physicists. And then you have people that think in words. Betsy's a, uh, someone who definitely thinks in words. Also, people can be mixtures. But the thing I like to emphasize is how these skills can be complementary. Because what we did on the new book on visual thinking is I'd write the rough drafts. They'd be kind of disorganized. Betsy would straighten them all out and organize them. Okay. So that's using the complementary skills. Now, Betsy, um, in the book um, where you guys describe this, I think you also provide a, um, a questionnaire um, so people can figure out what kind of a thinker they are. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. It was developed by um, a woman named Linda Silverman in Denver, who's worked with uh, kids on the spectrum for many years. And she developed it over many years using many questions. And it was um, a study that it, it um, got boiled down into an 18 question questionnaire, which asks things like, do you like to navigate with a map or in your mind? Some th things like that. And uh, depending on how many yeses you get, you you see that you are more of a visual thinker. And I think Temple scored 16 out of 18, and I scored four out of 18 to give you an idea of how far apart we are on that spectrum. So this is not just for uh, determining um, where uh, autistic what kind of thinkers autistic people are, but it'll work for all of us? Oh, no, definitely. That works, that works for everybody. Now, what tends to happen when a kid gets some kind of label, like such as autism, is they might be an extreme object visualizer. But there's also another autistic person that might be an extreme visual spatial mathematical thinker. And what you won't have is an expert object visualizer and an expert mathematical thinker in the same person. 
they're actually kind of opposite traits and that has shown up in the research yeah and where do you find um where do most people fall uh do, do we find that uh, people with autism do they is there a different um distribution on the bell-shaped curve or Don't the same know. Because there are also some autistic people that are word thinker and they love facts about, they often love history and things where there's facts. They might know all the facts about baseball or certain types of movies. They would know all the facts about them. Now, I, I saw a gentleman uh, um, on America's Got Talent. Uh, he was blind, he was autistic, but boy, could he sing. It's just amazing how he yep. could sing. And so what kind of a thinker would he be? Well, probably, uh, probably more of a pattern thinker. Now, the other thing, we've written some about uh, blind people in uh, visual thinking. Uh, in a sighted person, the visual parts of the brain take up almost a third of the brain, big piece of real estate. So if you're born blind, that real estate doesn't stay blank. The auditory system will go in and, and, and take over. And there's some blind people that actually can learn to echolocate, you know, similar to a bat and, and I, you know, repurpose that visual cortex. I had a blind roommate when I was in graduate school and it was amazing what, what she could do with her cane. Um, like at the beginning of each semester, somebody had to do sighted guide once the leader to the new classrooms. And she'd know by feel putting the cane on the pavement where to go hmm. with just being led sighted guide once. So Temple, do you have any insight, right? You've got these people that, that think differently. Uh, I'm going to have to go, go to the book and, and, and take the quiz to find out how I think. Cause I, I, you know, I, while, uh, um, I was listening to the book and I was like, I wonder which one I am. And I haven't got it figured out yet. So I'll take the test, but how do different people, or do you have advice for people that think differently? How can they work together um, to, to improve the outcome of, of, of the project? Well, the first step is you have to realize people think differently. I yeah. do a lot of talks to corporations and I said, you need these skills or these different kinds of thinkers. So realizing that people do think differently. Now let's go back to the food industry and the meat industry because that's the one I know the most about. I went back to all the projects. I've worked for every major meat company on equipment design. And I'd be out on these big, complicated construction sites, putting in all this complicated equipment. And when I went back through all the projects and listed them, um, well, when we were working on the visual thinking book, I found that there was a division of engineering labor that was the same for every company. And the guys in the shop, maybe had taken a single welding class, um, they were the ones inventing and building complicated mechanical devices. Think packaging machines, uh, mechanically complicated devices. The degreed engineers, the mathematicians, were doing boilers, refrigeration, wind loads, power loads, water requirements. And where we're losing the skills in what I call the clever engineering department, those visual thinkers like me, object visualizers, and I talked to a bunch of them, algebra is something they have difficulty doing, that's screening them out. And these are the this is the reason why a lot of this equipment now is coming from holland because the people i worked with have retired out and another mistake that was made taking out shop classes so these people aren't getting replaced and also many of these companies shut down in-house engineering departments and that made money in the short run but then as all the local shops retired out now you've got one shop left. Boy, let me tell you, they are gouging, price gouging right now, 10 times the cost of things to fix things. Do you think other people have identified, the, the education system has identified some of these gaps and is anything being well, done? Well, I, I, I think there's some educators get it, but there's also some educators that aren't even aware that my kind of thinking exists. They will say, well, you need algebra in order to think logically. I don't use algebra to think logically. And when I was doing a book signing for visual thinking, I went to school uh, that um, they did the, the, my talk at a school. And I talked to the principal. He didn't even know what my kind of thinking is. And he was asking me over and over again about how I think. And I think there's some people that 
I had somebody call it conjecture that talking about the way I think. Hmm. You know, I think there's some educators uh, that don't even want to believe that it exists. And these are people that never worked with factories. I mean, I spent 25 years in heavy construction. I watched hmm. how these people did things. Most educators have never done anything like that. Right. You know, uh, talking a little bit about how you think, I, I was uh, quite fascinated in, in, in hearing you describe it in uh, Thinking in Pictures. And I mean, it's, it's, I think a lot of us, at least me, I mean, I'm sure I see things as I think, but, but you're almost like looking at, uh, I think I, I think you even said you, you superimpose it on a screen. And you actually see a picture and you're able to turn it like uh, 3D and look at it from different directions. I tend to rotate myself around it. Like, okay, I become a drone. Now, of course, when I first started, drones didn't exist. But I can, I, I kind of fly the drone around it, walk mm -hmm. around it, fly the drone over it. Hmm. I don't rotate the object. I rotate myself. Or if I think if for the, a drone is a really good way to look at it. I'd be controlling a drone that goes around and looks at it. And, and then I remember getting in some fights on some early jobs where some rails fell down in a plant. And I'm going, well, how could they be that stupid? Couldn't they see that if they put that load on there like that, it's just going to tear the rail out of the ceiling? Well, this is before I learned that other people didn't think visually. Mm -hmm. You see, we need both the visual side of engineering, and that's the industrial design side, and we need the um, the mathematical type. Now I want to talk about science. Um, we're getting more and more into fancier statistics and more and more math in science, different types of science experiments. And what's happening is I'm seeing method sections of papers where they leave out crucial things like what type of apparatus did you use to mix cancer samples? We have this in the visual thinking book. Uh, the type of mixing device you use can totally change the results. You better state what it is. The type of bedding you put in your rat cage can change behavior results. I review a lot of papers and I go, I can't believe this. They didn't tell me what they fed the pigs. They didn't tell me how they housed the cattle, whatever it was. These basic, basic things are left out. And then they got every fancy pile of statistics you can think of when maybe a simple t-test would have worked. <laughs> And this is where you need me to read the method section of the paper. I just read the latest fusion experiment. And one of the things that made it work was making this little ball and it perfectly round. I wonder who built that. Some guy in a shop somewhere, not getting mm -hmm. enough credit for it. Very interesting. Um, I want to circle back to uh, your work with animals. Do you have any idea in terms of how animals think as any clues that we have? I can tell you something we definitely know. They don't think in words. They live in a sensory based world, okay. not a word based world. That's the first thing I tell veterinary students. First thing you got to do is get away from verbal language. What is it seeing? What is it smelling? I remember, Betsy, when you got a dog, I told you to go out and watch. Watch exactly what it does. It's a sensory-based world. I just learned there was a study done at Cornell, and they found that dog has a huge internet connection from the nose to the visual cortex. Smell pictures? Think how trippy that is. And Betsy gave me a really great book called The Immense World, and it's about animal senses. Like the octopus, it's all about feel, lives in a tactile world. It's a sensory-based world. Now, we have a chapter in visual thinking about animal consciousness. I find it just ridiculous. We've got people questioning whether a dog is conscious. And I think it basically gets down to verbal thinking versus other sensory-based thinking. You know, if you're an extreme verbalizer, and these might be the people that think that visual thinking is conjecture, um, you might have a hard time imagining that um, I, other kinds of thinking exist. So, you know, and they think, well, how could the dog possibly think? 
And I notice when you read on when the papers come out of the psychology department, more likely to deny animal thinking than maybe come out of the computer science department. In fact, one paper written by computer scientists said, well, it gets down to verbal versus nonverbal thinking. Now, understanding how animals think, what, what kind of advice uh, would you give for pet owners? Um, maybe identify some things that maybe we're not doing right today and things that we ought to change based on understanding animals. I'm very concerned a lot of dogs just don't get enough stuff to do. Mm -hmm. Bored. That's why they're eating up the house. They don't get out and socialize with other dogs. Uh, they're afraid of everything because um, they don't get out and see enough stuff. Uh, problems with fear of the vets gotten worse and worse and worse. They haven't been trained to tolerate strange people touching them. Now, a lot of dogs are leaving way too sheltered a life. Yeah. And they don't get to have doggy social life. And and now that you know, a lot of people got pets during COVID and they were with their owners 24-7. And now the owners are going back to work. And there's getting me bad problems with separation distress. Yeah. I remember when I got my dog, Temple said that all animals seek freedom and to see if I could get her off leash as much as possible. So I started taking her to this fantastic trail where you never saw anyone else, every now and then another owner and dog. And my dog, little 10 pound cockapoo, ran like a deer throughout the woods, smelling, jumping, running. And now at 16, she still does all that. And my vet said, well, she's in fantastic condition. Her heart is so strong. And I knew it was because of all that off-leash exercise she got, all that incredible freedom to roam and smell. And uh, I mean, she's obviously a domesticated little dog. She's not a wild animal, but she's had a lot of time to be free. And I really saw that at work. Well, and the other thing, some people say, well, what if we just put the dog on a treadmill? I don't think that's going to replace it. And, and... I've been thinking about the smell pictures. We now, now, uh, now, unfortunately, this is not in visual thinking because this study got published after the book went to the printers, but uh, really trippy. I'm going, wait a minute, what this brain scan of this dog shows that was done at Cornell University um, is that the dog has smell pictures. I'm going, that's very trippy. So I'm at this veterinary conference and I'm going up the escalator and I'll keep up my head down. Okay, now I can smell machinery grease down there. Now I can smell the popcorn they're serving at the trade show. <laughs> and I put my head up like that. And I'm thinking about the detail the dog could get of a smell picture. Mm. Really trippy. Yeah, very interesting. So Temple, what do you think about pets and emotions? Um, well, pets have got emotions. There's no uh, question yes. that. In fact, one of my earlier books, Animals Make Us Human, um, I, I worked with Katherine Johnson on, uh, we went over all of the pants get research on animal emotions. And it's very clear they have emotions. And there's seven basic emotional systems. There's fear, and there's anger. Then there's separation distress. And separation distress is a different emotion and a different brain system than fear. Then you have seek or the urge to explore. Some animals have a high urge to explore. Like some cattle, if you put GPS collars on them, they graze a whole bunch of pasture. Others just lay around the water hole. One's a high seek, the other's a low seek. And then you've got um, a sex drive. You've got the mother young nurturing. That's the oxytocin system. And you've got uh, uh, play. Now, what separates us the most from the animals is not emotions. It's pure computing power. We've got computing power sitting up here that a dog doesn't have. The stats come. You know, um, people tend to like to think of dogs and cats. Of they, they, they tend to project our emotions and the way we think on on them, um, and it's not true. What What are some of the problems that that causes, and what kind of advice would you give? Well, there's some uh, places where you know emotions are similar. Um, okay, separation, distress, and grieving is, you know, kind of the same thing. You get scared. And people that, you know, don't see enough new things get scared of new things. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, fear of heights. People and animals both have that. Yeah. Visual cliff effect. You have a, 
you have a, a sheet of glass over a four foot drop off, a baby and a lamb will both refuse to cross that. It's fear of heights. See, that's, that's a primal fear, fear of falling. That's why I emphasize for both pets and for cattle, it's very important to have non slip flooring. You know, mm -hmm. and then we put them on a smooth exam table at the vet clinic and they're spread out like that, slipping. Let's put a mat on that table yeah. so the dog has a non slip floor because that's a real primal fear. And then there's, and then you kind of have to look at things. How does a dog, you know, look at something? One of the yeah. big mistakes that people make is accidentally reward bad behavior. And I've you know, been explaining to some students yesterday, we were out at the farm and we've got some really tame research steers. They're tame pets. They have names. And, and the students were petting them. And I explained that these are large animals. And if they push on me, I'm not going to pet them. They're big animals. I can't have them pushing on me. If they're mobbing and pushing, and I, I'm not going to put the feed down because that's rewarding pushy behavior and people will do that not even realize they're doing that yeah no i'm going to put the feed down the moment they stay a little bit quiet you know one of the things that um, fascinates me is 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 your ability to put yourself in the place of the animal whether it's you know in the squeeze chute um is that a learned skill or is that something that just came naturally to well, you well i just um you know i was one of the first people to notice <clears throat> that animals were would get really afraid of stuff like shadows and you can have shadows that change with the time of day. I'm trying to find this shadow on my phone that I call the spider monster that, um, oh yeah, here it is right here. Here's a big shadow I call the spider monster. Mm -hmm. And, and it was at a big meat plant that was not there at 10 o'clock in the morning. Everything's working fine at three 30 in the afternoon. This shadow appeared it's from the overhead structure. And these cattle decided they were not going to walk over that. And, and then I pointed out to somebody and they go, yeah, well, that's obvious. But I, we, we get back out there after lunch and the cattle were refusing to go. And then I saw the spider monster. I got to get a picture of that. Hmm. Um, but people tend to not see that. You see, and shadows change with the time of day. I instantly saw it. Another thing that was happening at the same place, there was a gate handle that just wiggled like this. Well, let's stop it from wiggling. Those are the little things that cattle tend to notice. Is that your ability just to concentrate on details? Is that what, what that well, is? Well, I, I, I just, the other thing I have to, I can train people. I, I one time, the same plant called me up. They had a problem at night. They said the cattle get halfway up the chute and stop. So I said to the guy, I want you to bring up nice and calm. I want you to watch your leader. And when the leader stops, what is he looking at? He'll show you. And there was an LED light on the side of the building hmm. that he didn't like, and they got rid of that. Hmm. Very interesting. And they, and they were able to do that on themselves. So Temple, not only have you uh, done a lot, quite a bit of work in, in animals, but you've done a lot of work with working with families, with children, with well, autism. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, one of the biggest problems I'm seeing right now is to, it's like these dogs that don't get out and see enough stuff and they're afraid of everything. These autistic kids are getting too over shoulder and they're not learning basic skills like shopping, bank account, ordering food in restaurants, learning how to greet people and shake hands. Just very basic things that I learned when I was seven and eight years old. You see, social skills are not taught in the same structured way that they were in the 50s. Um, but I'm appalled at the amount of teenagers, fully verbal, who have never gone in a store by themselves and bought something. I mean, and this is coming up all the time. So what's you structurally changed? Oh, I tell them that they, I said, the next time you go to a gas station and you're pumping gas, you need to hand the kid a $5 bill and send them into the shop to buy a jug of milk. And you're right there. You can see in there. Hmm. That's where you start. Or I was at the airport and a mom and her 12 year old daughter came up to me and, and they wanted a picture. And, and then I said to the girl, have you ever gone in a store and bought something yourself? And she had not, I handed her a $5 bill and there was a little shop across the hall. I could go in that shop and buy something. 
It was right there. We could see it. Mm-hmm. And she came back with a Mountain Dew and uh, gave me the change. First time she'd ever shopped. That's ridiculous. So, so what what does structurally change about um, our society or the the family well, structure it, that it, the it, kids aren't getting that kind of? For the parents get too much into the label. Mother had a very good sense that she had to get me out to doing things. And. And when I was 13, she got me a little sewing job with a seamstress that worked out of her home. That was just done in the neighborhood. I had an allowance. And I knew I could, with 50 cents, it was about $5 now. 50 cents and I could get five comics or 10 candy bars. But if I wanted a 69 cent airplane, I had to save for two weeks. Mm-hmm. And I'm realizing how important that training was. And kids aren't getting that. Yeah. And it really, and it hurts the autistic kids more. I just ran into a kid last night who had never gone shopping. And I told the mother that she needs the next time, you, you know, a mom pumps the gas, the kid goes in the store and buys something. Yeah. It kind of reminds uh, me of the conversation we had just a bit ago about animals, right? And, 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 and getting them out and teaching them and getting them socialized and <laughs> at a very young age. Um, you terrified of do ev- everything. Yeah. And and I'm and they're having all kinds of behavior problems we didn't have before. See, when I was a child, the dogs ran loose. Now the downside was car accidents. That was the downside. But they were out socializing with other kids and other dogs, and we just didn't have all these behavior problems we've got now. Yeah. Yeah. Betsy, you're gonna uh comment before and uh, I'll cut you off. Do you remember what you were gonna ask? Um, I think you were asking about um, parenting um, au- kids with autism, with autistic right. traits, and Temple's observed that at so many autism conventions where, as she said, kids are never trying anything, doing anything, stuck on um, stuck on their video games, and parents, the labels really locking people in, and parents being even worse helicopter parents than they are today, kids not having any freedom to explore, to build things, to just root around in mom's sewing box or dad's toolkit, uh, such basic things that kids aren't being exposed to anymore. And especially if you're a visual thinker, learning at a young age that you can build anything, put together any Lego um, box, with, even without the instructions, these, these kids just need to be pushed in the areas that they are naturally good at and gravitate toward, but we're sort of trying to make it an one size fits all education and the same with disabilities. Just there's this focus on disabilities that are preventing people from exploring their their gifts. And I mean, Temple really, everything you did at that farm set the stage for a life of tremendous success with animal behavior and designing equipment, um, and communication, which, you know, very few people would expect from somebody with autism. You've talked to probably, what, hundreds and thousands of people at this point in your life, um, communicating one of your greatest skills of all. Well, when I started out my livestock stuff, I can remember when I got invited for my first big livestock conference. That was a real breakthrough. But um, there's a scene in the HBO movie where I go up and I get the editor's card. And he was the editor for our state farm magazine. Mm-hmm. I remember that. And that's happened. And I started writing for that magazine. That really helped my career. And I got a reputation that if I covered the Arizona cattle feeders meeting, it was covered accurately. And I'd summarize the speeches accurately. Um, because one thing that's helped me to be influential is I would design a corral system or something like this. And then I would put the directions out there on how to make it the drawings and the materials and just explain how to make it. Long a lot you do. That do a lot of great innovator innovation in, in a lot of things, whether it's education or whether it's something like grazing or something like this, but no, but nobody's writing about it. You still do a lot of writing temple. Yes, I do. In fact, I got a paper right here on grazing. Okay. I'm getting, I'm getting really interested in regenerative agriculture. This is raising cattle, sheep, and goats are an important part of a sustainable agricultural future. 
and I went and looked up every scientific study I could find on rotational grazing and soil health and improving the land, cover crops and grazing cover crops, you know, things we can do with livestock to improve the land. Um, yeah, very interesting. I want to encourage that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Temple, can you talk a little bit about the, the, the future of um, ag? We were kind of talking about sustainability there. What are some well, directions gonna, that you think again, we need to go? I, let's work on, on some doable things. Okay, I just told you about I went to this disability meeting. It was about travel stuff. Well, the blind person, I want to make him a gate finder app because he told mm -hmm. me that's his worst problem at the airport. Okay, that is something specific that I can do. It's not abstract. It's also something I know that wouldn't be that hard to do. Right. Um, I want to, I, right now, one of my big things I'm working on is I want to see the kids who think differently get out and have really good careers. And I tell business leaders, and I've talked to steel companies, computer companies, pharmaceutical, all kinds of different things, travel companies. Um, you need these skills. You actually need these skills. You don't have to do it to be just to be nice. You need them. You need someone to fix airplanes. You know, the, these skills are needed. Yeah. Talk about changing some of the interview processes where you show off portfolios of work. That's how I sold my cattle handling jobs. I would show off a portfolio of my work. In fact, here I'm going to show you some of my drawings right here. I would just show people my drawings. That's how you deal with not interviewing well. Show the work off. No, I want to help these kids that are different get into really good careers. So that's something I want to do now. And what I did on my cattle handling stuff, I published it all. The drawings, it's all online. It's in books. I've got book, two books on just on cattle handling. Are, are there some innovations that still need to take place with animal handling? The biggest thing in animal handling is management. I just got an email about a dreadful animal shelter and understaffed mess, which also sounded like that maybe it was underfunded. But what I have found is management sets the tone for the animal handling. The management has to decide they are going to handle cattle right or whether it's pets in an animal shelter, whatever it is. They've got to, uh, management sets the tone. You need to have good facilities, but um, facilities alone won't do it. You also have got to have management. And it sounds like animal shelter. They they put two animal shelters together. I think they ran out of money. Um, but I you have to. Uh, I have seen places get good with the change in management. I've also seen them get terrible with the change in management. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I've learned, it's constant. It's sort of like traffic out on the highway. If the police weren't out there all the time with the speed cameras, can you imagine what the freeway would be like? If you didn't have some enforcement of traffic rules. And I find I always have to keep talking about basics, like non-slip flooring. Just last year, 2022, I went in a brand new cattle handling facility with a slick floor. I have all kinds of stuff out there on how to do flooring. And you don't hard trial that smooth. Yeah. And that's what they did. Yeah. You know, find I still have to talk about these basics and so i said there's some rubber mats you can get and you're gonna have to get them yeah betsy uh you've written some books with temple and and i'm sure you've learned a lot over the course of doing that over the several years um what are some big topics that maybe we haven't touched on so far well we um temple wrote two books for middle grade students one's called calling all minds, all minds which is all about invention and it connects up Temple's favorite inventors. You, you had a book as a child that had all the inventors and you loved it. And so you connected all of that up with how we think and how we build and make things. And the second book uh, was also a lot of fun called The Outdoor Scientist, which is all about science and nature with also lots of um, great activities for, for kids to do. And both books, I think, really open the minds, not just of kids, but of parents, how the world around us, not just our screens, is really where the wonderful information comes from. And both those books just encourage kids to get out and uh, 
and make things, discover things, whether it's the beach, whether it's your city street, it doesn't matter where your environment is. There's so much, even just in the sidewalk, we, we talked about, you know, what, what cement made of. <laughs> it's actually pretty interesting. Um, I was obsessed as a child with little chips of mica that I would see in the cement that I thought was like street paves of, you know, the expression streets paved with gold. Oh, yeah. When I was little, I took that literally. And of course I found out that wasn't true, but then I see these little flicks, flecks, yeah. you know, what were they? I didn't have Google, you know, I had a encyclo uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. That's what these books in Temple really encourages people to do, to chase their curiosity. And uh, just like you want to let your dog sniff for as long as she wants to, because that's her world, we really have to allow our kids to do the same. And, and we have to do it too. We can't lose our sense of curiosity just because we can get any question answered on our phone. Well, when I did the a book signing for this, it was about four years ago now, um, I did it in a suburb um, outside of Denver. 20 to 30% of elementary school children had never made a paper airplane. I totally removed from the world of the practical. I had a girl in my cattle handling class last year who had never used a ruler or a tape measure to measure anything. In other words, totally separated from practical things. And we have to make policy about important stuff like power grid and things like this with people that are totally separated from the practical. And then when I heard, when they had some power grid failures, I'm just appalled at the abstract nonsense they talk about. Like when the power grid went down in Texas, all the stuff they put in the papers is abstract nonsense. No, I want to know what froze in each one of those planes. And I know if enough about equipment that if I found out what froze in each plant, then I can rank them in difficulty of fixing them. Very interesting. Yeah, you see, I, it was going to be nothing abstract. It was like 15 plants. I want to get a list of them. Well, I can tell you right now, you turn me loose for three hours in that plant, I'm going to head right down to their maintenance shop. And we get rid of the suits, and they'll tell me, they'll show me exactly what froze, and they won't lie to me. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm kind of losing track now. Can we go run through your books really quick? Oh, okay. I'm losing count. <laughs> Well, I've got a lot of books, and I also have got books on, on also on cattle handling. I've got Temple Brands and yeah. Guide to Working with Farm Animals. That's a really good book for kids and small farms. And then I've got Humane Livestock Handling. This has all the detailed drawings for things like uh, uh, cattle handling facilities where things are welded and you build them from scratch. Uh, I have textbooks uh, such as uh, Improving Animal Welfare, a Practical Approach, one of my textbooks. I've got three textbooks. Um, I've got some other autism books, different, not less. That's um, 18 adults um, telling about their experiences later in life. And this is where a diagnosis was helpful. The older person getting a diagnosis later in life, it was almost a relief, it helped with their relationships. But what I'm seeing on the fully verbal kids on the job front, it's holding them back on the job front. Folks, we're getting toward the end. They just flickered the lights. That means it's last call. So what I'd like to do is have uh, each of you guys uh, kind of wrap things up for us. Our last call question is sponsored by AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine, the next generation in amino acid balancing. With AminoSure XM, you can save up to $0.05 cents per cow per day on your methionine investment. Try it today and receive an additional 2.5 cents per cow per day savings with Belchem's limited time rebate offer. Contact your Belchem representative to learn more. I'm going to start with Carrie. Um, Carrie, what's a couple interesting things that you learned today? I think for me is just to recognize and understand that we all think differently. I think that we get in this idea that, you know, well, why didn't you agree with me or see it my way, right? But I think we should all be more understanding of that. And because in the end, we can use those um, attributes together and create more successful outcomes, both in the human and animal realms. Yeah, well said, Carrie. Uh, Betsy, uh, 
you've known Temple for quite a while. Um, what else should the, the audience know about Temple and her career? Well, Temple is an inspiration to, I think, everyone she meets. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of going to Colorado where she was honored um, for many years of service. And I met with so many of her former students and each one said the same thing. She changed my life. Um, Temple's devotion to making the world a better place across, across all fields is just incredible inspiration. And my life has been so enriched working, working with you, Temple, um, the books, but also her gold standard for how to conduct yourself in life. She has a, um, a phrase called project loyal, which means you put your ego to the side and you get the work done and you finish the project. And in book publishing, let me tell you, there are a lot of egos, <laughs> big ones and learning to put that aside and get my job done as the editor agent to get people to get their work done and stay project loyal and, I think we all need to be project loyal to everything we work on, whether it's our relationships, our families, how we care for our pets, really keeping that. Um, it's both a moral center and a creative center and uh, just a genuine reason to get up every day and really do your best. I think Temple, you um, exemplify that um, in a way that I've never experienced with anyone. Well, I think now, I'm, I'm in my 70s now, um, one of the big things I'm working on now is I want to show people different kinds of thinking exist. And these skills can be complementary. You see, this is the thing, like Betsy and I working on the visual thinking book. That's an example of complementary skills. You have the object visualizers like me. We're good at art, mechanics, photography and animals. Those things, mechanics and art tend to go together. Then you got the mathematical, visual, spatial, music and math minds. Then you have the word minds, much more linear, often generalized. Now, the interesting thing I've seen is in startup companies, you probably got the visual thinkers and the math thinkers inventing something new, but then you need a verbal thinker to actually run the business because you've got people that are startup people. I've seen that in the food industry. But then you need somebody else to just come in and run the business, keep the payroll paid, pay the rent on the building, just keep things going. Then the techies will call that hiring a suit. And I've learned a lot because when I was young uh, and mistakes were made on jobs, I used to think it was stupidity. Well, I was wrong then. It's they don't see it. But then the people that think verbally need to recognize that when their visual thinker um, warns them about something, that could be an engineering hazard, they better pay attention to it. Yeah. Temple, um, you, you mentioned that you're, uh, you're in your 70s now. You know, most people your age are slowing down, winding down, but that doesn't appear to be the case with you. Uh, what, what's the future hold for you? Well, I'm gonna, gonna, going back on a heavy travel schedule now. I'm, you know, I've got other things I still want to you know, do writing on. I want to encourage the get people to think differently uh, to get out and have a successful career. I'm seeing too many kids labeled autistic getting addicted to video games. They're not getting great video game jobs. Mm -hmm. If they were, I wouldn't be criticizing it. So the most fun I ever had is we'd sit around the job trailer or sit around the shop and we, we'd brainstorm on how to build stuff, you see. And that's friends who shared interests. The most funnest stuff I ever did was in construction. Also, some of the most nerve-wracking and stressful stuff. You got a whole bunch of money tied up in something. Is it going to work? You know, that can be, it was also some of the most stressful times. Yeah. But I think for me, having a career where I've done you know, stuff to make, make improvements, you know, I get asked, well, what's the meaning of life? Well, it's one simple thing at a time. When a mom comes up to me and says, my kid got a job because of one of your books or my kid graduated from college because of one of your lectures, that makes me happy. I, those are the things that are important. And that's stuff I'm working on now. Yeah, you know, there's things I don't do. I used to climb up a feed mill just to get a picture. I wouldn't be caught dead climbing up a feed mill now. <laughs> that's 75 years old. There's no way. So physically, I can't do some of the things, but uh, 
hope, hopefully when you get older, you get wisdom. And I want, I, I we want to see the kids that are different, be successful. We've got to find practical solutions to problems. You know, I, I get invited to a lot of corporations, you know, through, through the diversity part. And I want to emphasize it. You need to hire these people because they can actually solve problems. Your company needs them. Yeah. Talk to a steel company and I go, you, but you need the person like me who can't do math to keep your mill from falling apart. Yeah. And for, okay. some, and for some people, that'd be a very satisfying career, not for everybody. I'm a big fan of getting a lot of different kinds of hands-on classes back in the schools because that gives kids a chance to try a musical instrument, try theater, try welding, try mechanics, try cooking, try sewing. Because what I've learned about careers is it's exposure and then mentoring. Yeah, and that's definitely true for me. Animals came when I was a teenager. Yeah. Well said. And I'm sure you're quite a mentor. Uh, Temple, want to thank you for allowing us to honor you and your career here on uh, the Real Science Exchange. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. I'm a little bit jealous of Betsy. She's gotten to know you uh, uh, for, for many, many years now. One thing that I've uh, that we haven't talked about is you, you come across as a very kind person, you know, during the conversations that we've had on the phone. And, and, uh, uh I really appreciate that about you. Uh, appreciate all the things that you've done for our industry, the passion and, and the joy that you bring to it. And, uh, Betsy, I also want to thank you for coming and sharing your memories and your insights, uh, into, uh, Dr. Grandin. Um, and lastly, Carrie, thank you for joining me once again. And thank you to our loyal listeners for coming again to, uh, join us on our journey. Appreciate you guys sticking with us at, and we'll be around hopefully for 60 more exploring more topics. And so as always, I hope you learned something. I hope you had some fun and we hope to see you next time here on the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.